Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Mark Farzi. This is the Farzi Show, presented by MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. So much to get into today. Sixers beating James Harden and the Clippers. James Harden playing like straight ass in the game, and then dodging reporters after. But you know, that's just that's just petty stuff, right? Tyrese Maxey was awesome. Kelly Oubre. I know that I was ripping Kelly Oubre when it came to everything about uh, you know, uh, you know, not passing the ball when you have wide open ball, wide open guys uh, you know, on the perimeter. Turns out those guys like Buddy Hill haven't been very good at uh, dropping the three. So maybe maybe Kelly Oubre was right. And then uh, just amazingly aggressive, amazingly aggressive over the last I'd say you know, two three weeks. I mean his great game is naturally aggressive. Um, but it's really worked out for him as of late. Really worked out for him, especially on the defensive end. Loved what I've been seeing from Kelly Oubre over the last couple of weeks. And uh, yesterday's game against the Clippers was no exception. Sixers able to get that victory. Uh, we'll get into that game. We got the the Hassan Reddick news, which is, I, I guess, it's it's progressing in a way I don't want it to progress. Like I, I The guy's a playmaker, and I don't want to lose playmakers on defense. I want the defense to be as stacked as the offense. And if you're not going to have a, a reliable middle linebacker, now we'll see what happens with Kobe Dean. We'll see what happens, blah, 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 all that stuff. But like right now, my confidence level in the Eagles linebacking group, shockingly, is not very high. Not a lot of confidence in these Eagles linebackers. Can't remember the last time I really did have a lot of confidence in the Eagles linebackers. It certainly has been 20 years. <laughs> it's probably been 20 years. Uh, maybe that'll change at the draft. Maybe we could all be, you know, it, it, overly optimistic about how they could change at the draft. I know we've been in the past just fantasizing about what could happen, but uh, we'll get into that conversation today. Jeremy Fowler putting out a report that we'll talk about when it comes to uh, whether or not Asan Reddick is going to get traded and how that's going to go down. But it seems like things are certainly progressing in that direction. That's what I got out of Jeremy Fowler uh, and his reporting the ESPN over the weekend. Flyers took a big loss, unfortunately, to the Panthers, a team that they've uh, done pretty well against this season, but certainly not uh, yesterday. Not great. Not great. Uh, four to one loss. So we'll get into that conversation. And spring training, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the injured, I'll say, when it comes to spring training. Taiwan Walker, bullpen session scheduled for yesterday, uh, passed up on that opportunity, had a little tightness. And now he's being evaluated. So not great. When the season starts Thursday, Thursday, Phillies will wrap up spring training play today and they'll open up their regular season on Thursday, the 20. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I, I, I what all the stuff going on with the Eagles. We've been following that bouncing ball. We've been following that beat. I know the Phillies have taken a backseat. I think for those of you that know me, that, 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 that pains me to give the Phillies a backseat. However, uh, it's opening week for the Philadelphia Phillies, and I I just I can't wait. Watching the game yesterday, Boehm coming up with a big hit. Aaron Nola looking strong through five and two-thirds of scoreless work and their 2 nothing victory over the uh, over the Toronto Blue Jays. But uh, a couple of things, really the only thing that, that really has got me about the Phillies uh, comes down to, well, like two things, I guess. It's the back end of the bullpen. Uh, and, of course, it's the injury front. And if you're concerned about injuries, generally speaking, that's a good thing if the injuries haven't already happened. I know Bryce Harper has had this back issue that's led to his worst spring ever, so that's terrible. But if this is something that is going to continue and linger, as back issues often do, he says he's feeling good and all that, which is great. But that is certainly cause for concern when the guy that you're looking to be the answer and the man to take over the first base responsibilities for the foreseeable future after Reese Hoskins departed, uh, you, you want him to be playing ball, especially if he could play at an MVP caliber uh, you know, uh, level. And uh, you know he's a guy that could carry a team through September that everybody else might be struggling. He's a guy that's still mashing in September to make sure that if you don't win the division, and I love that JT Real Muto said last week, He's tired of seeing the Atlanta Braves win the division. That, to me, doesn't matter anymore. And it's great to win the division. It's nice to put a banner up, you know, at the ballpark. That's nice. You win the NL East. Cool. You know what's even cooler? You know, making it to the World Series. NL East pennants. Or, excuse me, NL pennants. That's nice. 
Uh, you know what else is nice? World Series parades. Those are nice, too. And the Phillies, over the last two seasons, of course, uh, although they haven't won the NL East, have certainly given us uh, some nice memories there in long, deep playoff runs, despite only being a wild card team. Would I like it to end with a loss? Would I like it to end in the World Series? Would I like it to end, you know, two games shy of winning the World Series? Do I want it to end a game shy of winning the uh, NLCS? No. Obviously, I don't want it to end like that. But it's still a nice ride. Pretty crappy ending, but still a nice ride. And they provide those nice rides despite not winning the division. It's a goal. Hey, look, the more games they win, the, the, the better off they are, right? I know that hasn't worked for the Mets. I know that hasn't worked for the Braves. Uh, but uh, with the Phillies being the kind of team they've been over the last couple of years, yeah, it wouldn't be terrible for them to all of a sudden dominate out of the gate. It'd be nice. It'd be real nice if we didn't wait till June for this team to go, oh, remember how we're good at this game? We should win more of these games. That'll be fun. Uh, as, as nice as that would be. The Phillies are really going to have to turn their ways around over the last couple of years for, you know, they're not to start out slow. And the way they can start out slow is if injuries creep up. You have the conversation about Bryce Harper. You have the conversation about Taiwan Walker. Um, so those are all things that we'll get into today. But first and foremost, let's start it off with our man, Asan Reddick. If you didn't see the report, here's the gist of it from our friends at Jacob Media, the way they – uh, broke it down here. ESPN's Jeremy Fowler reported that many NFL, many in the NFL expect Hassan Reddick to be traded eventually. Arizona Cardinals, Atlanta Falcons have been mentioned as possible landing spots for him. They also moved around a uh, million dollar bonus from him to be on uh, June 1st. So, uh, or excuse me, um, uh, April uh, 1st. So they moved some money around for him, which could lend the idea that he's getting traded what lends the idea of him getting traded is josh sweat getting the contract extension that's what really lends itself to being traded also the idea that the eagles have given him the permission to go seek a trade and he seems to have found some at least willing participants to have a conversation with the philadelphia eagles in making that trade happen let me just say it one more time for the people in the back i do not want this to happen I don't want a guy who's been a uh, three straight seasons with double digit sacks, a playmaking uh, the edge rusher, a guy that also two years ago, uh, let's see, uh, 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 led the league in forced fumbles and a tie of the lead, a share of the lead in that. Uh, also, second team All Pro. I don't want that guy gone. And you know, the cherry on top. He's from the area, and another cherry on top. He went to my college, Temple University. Okay, I don't want that guy gone. And in a defense that, and I can't stress enough, when we have a defense that we're going to be looking at here that is not going to be known for being aggressive, that is certainly not known over the years, whether it's here in Philadelphia with a with a copy of Vic Fangio's defense or Vic Fangio running his own defense, they are not aggressive defenses. So when you have the opportunity to get a guy like Bryce Huff, for instance, who is another, uh, maybe has had Reddick stud here, little uh, you know tip of what could be coming in the near future. When you have guys like that, if you're going to have Josh Sweat here, uh, who I know went, what, seven games without a sack towards the end of the season last year? That's not great. Uh, Bryce Huff and Hassan Reddick, those are at least guys that can win one-on-one -on -one battles. And then the in case of emergency break glass guy, Brandon Graham, bring him in for 35% of the snaps or whatever it could be in the upcoming season, and then maybe he could get after the quarterback as well. If you're not going to be running that aggressive defense, you at least want to have guys out there that can win those one-on-one -on -one battles. And Hassan Reddick is certainly one of those guys that can win a one-on-one -on -one battle without dialing up some kind of crazy, exotic, or overly aggressive blitz, still allowing you to have guys back in coverage. And maybe if it's explained to him before the season, hey, look, we're going to drive him back in coverage a little bit more than you're used to, maybe like Matt Patricia should have done before he took over the defense, well, then maybe that'll help, uh, I don't know, smooth things over so you're at least managing the expectations, which are wildly important in human nature to manage expectations. But the bottom line is I don't want him gone. I want him to stay here in Philadelphia. I want him to decide, I don't know, some kind of restructure, restructured deal and have him stay here in Philadelphia because I think he helps the Eagles defense. Now, if you're a sound Reddick and you think you have a trade partner and you think you have somebody else out there, whether that is the Falcons, whether, whether that is a reunion with the Arizona Cardinals, the team that drafted them out of Temple University, then maybe you're going to get the contract that you feel like you deserve. 
Maybe they are going to as part of the deal, which it probably is. Uh, part of the deal is to restructure his contract so he still gets paid substantially more than what the Eagles would be willing to pay. The other side of this, and I don't think this is the case because Fangio or not, but I've seen the conversation, maybe he doesn't want to play in the Fangio, the Fangio Fangio scheme, not the Gannon Fangio scheme or the Desai Fangio scheme. Maybe he doesn't want to play in the Fangio Fangio scheme. I get it. I can, I can understand why that might not be attractive to some you know, edge rushers, but he's had success already. Last year, we're talking about another double-digit sack season if he doesn't have that hand injury at the start of the year. I mean, he came out like a man on fire after he got that cast off his hand. He played like the guy that we had seen him play in 2022, the guy that was a second-team All-Pro, the guy that was helping this team get to 70 sacks in the regular season, the guy that was forcing fumbles, the guy that was making plays. Yeah, I don't want to lose that. But if he has the opportunity to go elsewhere and get that deal done, then he's going to go out and he's going to get that deal done. The other thing is, I think everyone understands, everyone realizes he doesn't want to leave Philadelphia. I think he loves the idea of you know being home. I think he loves the idea of playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. That's the the thing that I know some people bring up as if it's just poly pom-poms or being a homer, but that's something that he really loves. We've talked about it a lot, about having uh, still pinned to his uh, – Twitter page, I'm coming home before he signed with the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I've referenced his introductory press conference with the Eagles many times, and mostly about the kind of football he likes to play. He likes to play downhill, likes to be, uh, play aggressive, he likes to you know, play fast and all that stuff. That is not the, that's not exactly what Vic Fangio would be dialing up for him here in Philadelphia. If he likes to be aggressive, not something but that's him saying, and I think it's a very important question. It's one of the most important questions that you can get at any press conference. It's when you ask a, a player, a subject, a coach, if you ask them, when are you at your best? That's a question I even love asking. When are you at your best? Because it, it allows the, the player to tell you exactly how they're at their best. Now, sometimes they, they get a little smart, and they go, oh, I'm, I'm at my best when I'm doing whatever the team needs me to do. Okay, cool. But when do you, if you could call your own plays, what are you doing? And Asad Reddick talked about playing downhill. Talked about being aggressive, going after the quarterback, allowing you, uh, uh, giving him the opportunity to use his speed. Doesn't seem like something he's going to be doing too much under Vic Fangio. So maybe it's going to be uh, the thing that he doesn't want to happen, but the thing that he needs to happen. To go elsewhere, cash one of his last big checks, get one of his last big contracts, put up some numbers for himself in a different defense under a different defensive coordinator and make some good things happen for himself. Bottom line is, as someone who really likes it when the Eagles win a lot of football games, I want to sound Reddick here because I think he can help the Eagles win a lot of football games. And when I go through free agency, and by the way, I was on with uh, our man uh, Dan Cilio on uh, Friday, okay? <laughs> he asked me the kind of grade, what grade would I give the Eagles in the offseason here? And I said, if you include the coordinators, it's an easy A. Easy A. If you don't include the coordinators and you still have holes on defense, um, I'm going with a B plus. Pro football focus, without including the coordinators, also gave the Philadelphia Eagles a B plus. I think the Cowboys got a D, which is just fun to stare at and laugh at the Cowboys. Well, look at that. No kidding. A big D in Dallas? You don't say. That's fitting. Uh, Commander's got a nice little grade there. But anyway, um, Sills was asking me about this defense. Or excuse me about this defense. It's like, well, offense, you you got – you were good despite the end of the season fall off, right? You were good. You still got great weapons, and now you added another great weapon in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Saquon Barkley, which is great. Defensively speaking, though, I look at the the off the offseason acquisitions you've made so far. Chauncey Gardner Johnson to me is the most impactful player you have gotten defensively. I know a lot of people will look at the idea of bringing in Bryce Huff, and I am eager to see what Bryce Huff does with as I've described it many times. This huge promotion. Oh, you've done this in passing downs. Now do it in every down. Be that type of player, that aggressive player. Get after the quarterback. Now stop the run. This isn't something we're going to be talking about where you're only playing 41% of the snaps here, fella. We're going to get a nice uptick there. 
Are you ready for that challenge? Well, fifty-one point one million dollars has confidence that you're going to be you're going to be ready for that challenge. I hope that's the case, but we won't know until we actually see it. But defensively speaking, the move that has me even more excited, or more excited than even the the big money free agent acquisition, the guy that's supposedly on the upswing in his career, which is Bryce Huff, and I hope that is the case, obviously. But it's Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Defensively speaking, I'm still waiting for that move that has making me go, "Oh, look, they're serious about this." And Devin White is a is a I described him as a has been that could be again. But there's no slam dunk move. Chauncey Garner Johnson, I feel, is the closest thing you have had to that this offseason. What would really get things going here is seeing Edron Cooper in an Eagles jersey, seeing Trot Jr. in a uh Eagles jersey, James Bradbury on the move, even elevating Kelly Ringo to a starting position. Or maybe you go after uh, if you don't go offensive line, maybe you go Kool-Aid McKinstry there in the first round at corner. That would Huh. Oh, okay. All right. And then immediately, because it's an Eagles corner drafted early, I'd, I'd have no confidence. <laughs> the way it's kind of gone with Howie Roseman and then linebackers, similar to the way it's gone with uh, the Eagles and not drafting first-round quarterbacks since Lito Shepard. So that's 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 what I look at. In all honesty, and I know I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of Eagles fans here, but the grade question I want to ask you, now that things have kind of settled for a second here, Eagles did add Will Greer, of course, to uh, – their um uh their 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 quarterback factory, so there you go another backup quarterback there. Steve Mays who came ha- has a history playing with the Cowboys has a history there with Kellen Moore, so also with the Patriots. Um, at this point where we're at right now with the Philadelphia Eagles, what grade have you given them? How would you look at Howie Roseman this entire off season? Now, I'm not just saying just the uh, I'm including the coordinators in this because that matters. Going into last season, I said the two biggest question marks on this team have names, all right? Two biggest question marks. It's not a position group. I guess you could break it down to it and say there's one. But the two biggest question marks are named Brian Johnson and Sean Desai. Last year, we were doing the Sean Desai breakdown. What does he bring to the table? What is he going to do? Oh, he knows Vic Fangio. You're going to see that scheme. We know that Nick Sirianni likes to run this particular scheme. What are we going to get out of this? Um, it wasn't great. First half was usually pretty terrible. Second half, actually pretty good. Made those adjustments. So that means during the week, the game plan that you've been putting together wasn't great. But the adjustments were pretty good. And the game I always go to, it's a perfect example of that, would be the game against the Rams. When they were out there in L.A., and they're having all sorts of struggles against Cooper Cup just coming back. And then in the second half, they turn the tide. They make it a lot different. And they held him, it was, let's see, 97 yards in the first half to 25 in the second half. So they made some good adjustments on Cooper Cup. Uh, But obviously it wasn't enough because they had to go a different direction for, well, that's just what they decided to do. And I feel like that was the, that was, how would I, the best way to describe it would be, you know, the, 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 the final, I don't know, balloon popped. That would be the, I don't know, one more iceberg that hit the Titanic. I don't know, I don't know. But that'd be it. The straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. Um, that would be that. Offensively speaking, Brian Johnson, uh, no adjustments. Now you have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to experience. Last year, one year of experience in the position they were occupying with the Eagles. Brian Johnson, zero years as an offensive coordinator in the NFL. Sean Asai, one. So between the two, they just had one year, which is why, to me, they were the biggest question, question marks. So this uh, this year, they go far on the other side of that. They get a guy who's not only had experience offensively. I mean, we know the resume by now of Kellen Moore. But to just have that, I think, matters. We know the resume of Vic Fangio. To have that matters. We learned last year, oh, man. Every once in a while, you might find a diamond in the rough, like Shane Steichen, for instance. But other times, you fall flat on your face. And that's what happened at the end of last year. So you have to include coordinators, I feel. From last year, the end of last year, So right now, with the moves the Eagles have made, this is Son Reddick move uh, progressing, to use that word again. Jeremy Fowler again using the phrase that uh, it seems more and more likely the the, the feeling around the NFL is that Son Reddick will be traded at some point. Up until now, what grade would you give 
Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles with the moves they've made to this point. The draft is a little bit a little bit more than a month away. What grade would you give this Philadelphia Eagles team? Including the coordinators, I think it's an easy A. Take that away, I think B+. Plus. I'm still waiting for more on defense. Uh, but everything else, I think you got to include coordinators. That's why I think this team is going to make it a, an about face from how we last saw them get off the football field. Uh, the move that obviously moved the needle for me the most was uh, Saquon Barkley. And when I look at the end of last year, the move that really helps me turn the page is Saquon Barkley. That's the move that's really made me turn the page. Uh, Chauncey Gunner Johnson shortly thereafter, because I think the Phillies or the Phillies, the Eagles need every ounce, every ounce of opportunity. Um, when it comes to a uh, opportunistic safety and a versatile safety that we know CD Deuce can be. All right, what grade are you giving the Eagles, including the coordinators? Very important to stress that. Very important to stress that. By the way, I mentioned I'm gonna be, I was on with Dan Silling on Friday. Today, if you like me, bonus me today. I'll be on at uh, 9.30? What time did John text me? 9.20, 9.30? Some type John like that. 9.20. With our birds 365 friends, Jody Mack and Johnny Mack, uh, on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Uh, let's talk about your 76ers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first off, Tobias Harris scored the Sixers' first seven points of the game against the Clippers. Uh, Tyrese Maxey had himself a night, an afternoon, I should say. Uh, good game, not a great game. We've seen him put up more points, but uh, funny to say this. Tobias Harris was your leading scorer in yesterday's game. 24 points for Tobias Harris. Maxi dropped in 24 as well. So, you know, co-leading scorers, I guess. Uh, Kelly Uber only had 12, 12 points, but it was allowed 12 points. Also, uh, came up with that huge block on Paul George. Here's what I really loved about the Sixers. They came out on a mission. 41 points in the first, uh, first quarter. Uh, they came out swinging again. In the second quarter, third quarter, they started to lose a little bit of control. The Clippers come out, they start knocking down some shots. I think it was Paul George, uh, Harden, I think, had a shot there, and Kawhi Leonard. Um, they came out swinging there in the start of the second half. And the whole time, when you're playing a team like the Clippers, I'm always waiting for that moment where they're going to go on a run. The, you have guys like Kawhi, they're going to hit shots. James Harden's going to hit shots. He didn't in this game. Uh, Paul George is going to have his moments, like all that kind of stuff. You're going to have moments like that when you face good teams where if it's close or they're down, you know there's going to be a run here somewhere. The Sixers took that run on the chin at the start of the third quarter and then started to take real straight-up control in the fourth quarter. Though, that's what I like to invoke the phrase from uh, Breaking Bad. Be the one who knocks. Be the danger. I'm always waiting for that for the good NBA teams. And the Sixers right now is a play-in tournament team. You can't say, oh, they're a really good team. You can't say that without Joel Embiid. So right now at this point, I was waiting for the Clippers to make that run, hoping that the 76ers would be the team that knocks. Next thing you know, Tyrese Maxey knocks down back-to-back -back threes. Uh, Kelly Oubre comes up with the big block. Tobias Harris continues, gets back on track for what was a, a – by Tobias Harris standards, a stellar game. Paul Reed comes up with a couple of shots for you. Campaign knocks down five total threes in the game, including some money buckets there in the uh, fourth quarter. And it all ended with final was 121 to 107. And after the game, James Harden, who was it 13 points he ended up with? 12 points he ended up with on 5 of 13 shooting. 0 for 6 from beyond the arc. Um, that's when he missed that step back. Uh, left the locker room. Left the locker room before Ty Lu even addressed the media in his post-game press conference. A little better. A little better. It's nice. It's nice. Sixers fought against the Lakers. Didn't win. Sixers came out swinging against the Clippers. They won. Now they're at it again tonight. 10 o'clock tip off in Sacramento where they wrap up the uh, the West Coast road trip before they come back home. And then 
Maybe this time next week, we're talking about, oh, Joella Beach ramped it up a little bit. Let's hope that's the case. But really enjoyed that Sixers game. Really enjoyed Tyrese Maxey stepping up there in the fourth quarter. Really enjoyed Tobias Harris. Every once in a while, he'll give us a little flash in the pan and be like, oh, wait, he can be good at basketball. And then he's terrible at basketball for like three weeks, and then he plays a good game. Like, oh, look at that. Maybe we'll make it back to – what was it? He had a 28-point game and a 31-point game? Back-to-back games? Like, oh, maybe there's something. There's not. There's nothing. Let's hold out hope, though. Let's hold out hope. Uh, Sixers 39 and 32 now on the season. And like I said, they do sit in the play-in tournament aspect of things right now. Uh, they are a half game. Half game. Behind, behind the Indiana Pacers. Who draw the Clippers tonight? Maybe? Um uh, for the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference, Sixers and Heat are both a half game behind the Pacers. The Bulls are a team that's way down there, ninth seed right now. And the Magic are um, two and a half games better than everybody else uh, in the fifth seed right now. And the Celtics are just amazing. Not much you can do about the Celtics now, unfortunately. Uh, let's talk about your uh, Philadelphia Phillies. Yesterday, it was great to see this. Love to see this. Aaron Nola on the hill for the Phillies. He went five and two thirds in his last start of the spring and his final tune up. Love hearing that. Love hearing that. Uh, two hits, he surrendered, four strikeouts, one walk, lowered his ERA. Before the game, his ERA was north of five. Now, look, I don't like looking at numbers. I don't like looking at statistics when it comes to spring training. It's spring training. I like to go by, yes, the old adage of if a guy is really mashing, if a guy's really raking, or if a guy's really throwing heat during spring training and he's got like a 1.08 ERA in four starts, then, oh, my God, so young. No, I only think it carried away with that. But I like to follow the adage of if they do well, then the numbers matter. If they do terrible, bah, it doesn't matter. Like that, that's what I like about any type of preseason play, whether that be football, whether that be baseball, that's what I like to go by. Uh, but when they're actually good and they're a guy that has a track record of usually being pretty good, like Aaron Nola has a track record of usually being pretty good in an up and down years, usually with Aaron Nola, down year last year, means an up year this year. So to go by all the um, real weak poly pom poms analytics that I like to go by, Aaron Nola is going to have a great year. Uh, but before the game, he had an ERA north of five. After the game, ERA sub four, baby. 379 ERA for him on the season this year. Did like the news that the uh, Phillies got, or they at least put out yesterday when it came to Matt Strom. I like Matt Strom a lot. Very versatile player. He can play in the bullpen. Long relief. Can be a starter for you in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, in a crunch, right? I like all that. So they extended him yesterday, which is great. Jake Cave, you know. Speaking of a guy, like people are making a lot of Bryce Harper's numbers, and I understand that. Terrible. Worst spring he's ever had. Jake Cave on the other side was hitting 325. And it's like, you're going to Colorado, and we're getting back cash. That's all that matters here. So that's what the uh, Phillies did yesterday uh, off the field in the front office. Strom did pitch yesterday, by the way. He came in uh, after Nola, but an inning and a third, and, had a, and uh, recorded a strikeout. No walks, no hits. Um, but uh, as far as this Phillies team goes, I was looking at the lineup before the game, and I know without Schwarber in the lineup, and I know without um, uh, Merriweather, uh, Merrifield in the in the lineup, this isn't exactly what your opening day lineup is is going to be. But I like the idea of Stott leading off. Wouldn't mind that worked in a little bit throughout the season. Uh, Harper was back in the lineup again yesterday. Um, not great. Uh, 0 for 2 for him. Uh, Real Muto was batting cleanup. He took the O for as well. Boom, big day from the plate. Three for two, including an RBI double, which was nice to see. Uh, Marsh, Pache, but no Rojas yesterday. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Rojas did play yesterday. Uh, but Pache got in the game. Marsh got in the game. Yoan Rojas has made the big league ball club. So it looks like Rojas, Marsh, and Pache are going to be competing for outfield spots as well as with Merrifield. I wouldn't necessarily call it a log jam yet because, again, we talk about a guy like Johan Rojas. We're talking about a guy who's having a real struggle-filled spring, as we know. I find it interesting that they kept him uh, on the big league roster only because if you were really putting it out there for him to take this and run with it, as Dave Dombrowski said when spring trading was just getting underway, we talk about an open spot or two on the roster. 
Uh, and him being asked about Johan Rojas being your everyday center fielder, he said, this has got to be something that they go out there and take. You know, he's got to go out there and make the big league ball club. We talked about this on Friday. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with our friend Greg Murphy about how you don't want to just hand it to the player. Well, you kind of just handed it to the player. And I'm not, look, I'm not against it because I think he'll do better at the major league level than a 170 batting average. Again, it's spring training. I'm trying not to make too much of the numbers. But I think ultimately, by not having him start out the season on the big league roster, I think they're going to kill the guy's confidence. And I know that's a delicate thing in the world of baseball. That's something I, I buy into. I know some people are out hell of this confidence. If you're not good, then he shouldn't play. Like, I understand that. But bottom line is the guy can play at a gold glove uh, level. Larry Boa was shocked to see this the other day. Uh, Called him the, the best center fielder he's seen with the Phils. Guy played with Gary Maddox. That's something. Um. If you can get a defensive player like that in center field, then you have a defensive player like that in center field. And you look at the rest of this lineup and you go, all right, you know, Johan Rojas, we can understand that defensively speaking, you're going to be pretty stellar out there. Cover a lot of ground. In the event you got Brandon Marsh in left or you got Christian Pache in left, you, that's, a, that's a pretty good defensive outfield. Rest of the guys on this team will take care of the hitting part of it. You know, of course, you don't want that automatic out. We don't get it. But if there's going to be a lineup where you can kind of hide the bat of Johan Rojas, this is the lineup you can hide the bat of Johan Rojas. We'd love to see Marsh start out the way he started a year ago, especially coming off the injury, getting things going for himself the way he has in spring training. We'd love to see that. Um, started out real hot at the beginning of last season, if you remember. And then, of course, Johan Rojas came up and uh, kind of took us by storm as far as the defensive angle of the game went. Uh, but a very interesting what we're getting from the Phillies. And I... I if I could ask, if I could have one request, if there could be one big change from what we have seen from these Phillies deep playoff runs that we've had over the last two seasons, the first two two months of the season, man, they really, I don't like to use the word scared, but they grab your attention, the Phillies do. And I even remember, I remember starting June and the Phillies, they had just come off a series with the guys. They went into Washington. Rob Thompson makes the change to put Kyle Schwarber back at the top of the order. Uh, Trey Turner is going through his struggles. And then, little did we know that was just the beginning. And then all of a sudden, maybe the second or third game in June, they just started to turn things around. It makes zero sense to me to have Kyle Schwarber at the top of the order, like as as the leadoff hitter, even batting second, make to me makes a hell of a lot more sense. But for whatever reason, the Phillies are a thousand times better ball club with Kyle Schwarber's at the top of that order. I know it doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but if they win, that's the only thing that needs to make sense, right? I and, and the reason I even move him down one spot is because yes, the one thing you can say is you want to make sure that he gets as many at bats as possible. And if you're batting one, two, odds are you're going to be one and two in terms of at bats in uh, for your lineup, uh, for your roster. So, yeah, getting him to the plate as many times as possible to have him take that uh, Paul Bunyan esque uh, swing through the strike zone. Yeah, I want to give him as many opportunities as possible to bomb that ball into the right field stands by batting him first or second. First or second, you're giving him plenty of opportunities to hit those home runs. I just kind of like it when there's a, right out of the gate an opportunity to have a guy on base for you. Bryson Stott, because of so many pitches he sees, he'd be your prototypical leadoff hitter. Trey Turner would be a prototypical leadoff hitter, especially with his ability to um, steal bases. These are all great things that I want to see. But for whatever reason, this team just wins games with Kyle Schwarber batting first. Um, so if that's what they're going to do to start the season, then that's what they're going to do to start the season. But my request is, again, like, maybe you don't give us those two two months where we really sweat it out and think that everything's just going to be terrible with this Phillies team. Great disappointment. Don't make us wait till June. All right? Don't, don't tease us. You're either with us or against us. Don't, don't, don't do that. Please. Please don't tease us. Please. Can I make that request? Thanks. Let me tell you about the great people at my bookie. My bo oh wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Before I talk about my bookie, how dare I not talk about 
the national story that will get even more legs today. Shohei Otani set to address the media today. By Dave Roberts' mouth uh, yesterday, he was asked whether or not this was Otani's decision or this was the Dodgers' decision. Dave Roberts said, that was Shohei's decision. I was like, the way he said it, I was like, Ugh. all right, so let's just take him at face value. Let's say this show is decision. Fine. I don't know what we're going to hear today. But a formal press conference, not a uh, media scrum at Otani's locker. What, what are we going to get from Shohei Otani today and the new interpreter? Because uh, Mitsuhara is obviously no longer with the team. And no longer the interpreter of Shohei Otani. Uh, and allegedly has committed this, uh, according to Otani, Otani's agent, uh, committed this massive theft of Otani. I, I, I got questions. I said last week, I'm sure we'll hear from Otani in the very near future because I think he's he's going to want to address it. I'm just very curious to see how they handle this. Because I think today you're going to find out a lot as to, was he really involved in this? Or was it really a massive theft? Um, was it a favor? Was he covering the guy's gambling debts to to you know, be nice, or was the money really stolen? I think that's kind of when did you find out about this? When did you first hear about it? Was it really in the meeting? Because imagine you're Otani for that. Like imagine you're at work, all right, and they call a meeting with coworkers, not just they. Hey, come into my office. I going to talk to you. No, like this is in the clubhouse. And you're listening to, you're firing the interpreter because of a gambling thing? Oh, no way. Oh, wait, I'm involved in this too somehow? Maybe without even your own knowledge? And people are telling a room full of people this? I'm sorry, and you don't speak the language? At least fluently? That can't be a good moment. That's got to be a crappy moment. I, I, I look forward to seeing what information he is willing to give today. Because as uh, any lawyer might tell you, it's not necessarily what they're saying. It's what they're not saying. So if you hear the word no comment, first off, I'm looking forward to learning that in Japanese. Uh, but if you hear that word no comment, huh, okay, that'll raise my eyebrows a little bit. Well, look, what I'm hoping for, and this is a weird thing to hope for, but you don't want baseball to be tarnished. I never want baseball to be tarnished. I, wanna, I don't want anybody to be tarnished. You know, But it uh, seems like there's been a crime or something uh, a little fishy going on here. So the goal is to be get at the bottom of this. But I think what most people would like to see is the idea that um, Otani had nothing to do with it. He was the victim here. And I know if that's the story that does come out as the truth, baseball would go, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> you're talking about globally the biggest baseball star in the world. Uh, and that's where we're at with the Otani thing. So we'll address the media today, and we'll see what further information people are able to dig up, whether or not we have to read between the lines or whether or not we'll get a whole lot of information offered to us. Now, speaking of gambling, let's talk about MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Download the app to your phone. Use promo code FARZY. And play MyBookie, mybookie.ag. When you use my bookie, you use promo code FARS, you'll get up to a thousand dollars redeemable cash bonus with my bookie, mybookie.ag. Want to bet on the world of baseball? Go right ahead. Want to go to the world on uh, you know, like you want to bet like an interpreter? Go for it. You want to bet on the world of hockey? You can do it. You want to bet on the world of basketball? Go right ahead. All right, have your fun. My bookie, mybookie.ag. Use promo code FARS when you create an account and you get up to pro, uh, get up to a thousand dollars redeemable cash bonus at my bookie, mybookie.ag. Betting on sports not your thing. You can also bet on the world of politics if that's what you're into. You can also bet on the world of television. Who's going to end up with who? How's the episode end? All right there, my bookie, mybookie.ag. Download the uh, download the app. Create an account. Use promo code Farzi at mybookie, mybookie.ag. Also, let's not forget about the amazing people at the Game Time app. Want to go to the game? Want to go to the concert? Want to go to the big event? Check them out at the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app to your phone. Use promo code Farzi, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase on the Game Time app. They have last-minute ticket deals, flash ticket deals. They even have ticket deals for an hour after the event starts. So you might miss the opening act. No big deal. 
you're still there. You're still there at uh, with the great people at MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Download the app. Use promo code FARS and get $20 off your first purchase at, at uh, the Game Time app. Uh, how about PHL Sports Nation, Philadelphia Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's phlsportsnation.com. And let's not forget about our friends at Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. Check out Brett's amazing inventory at skymotorcars.com. Let's get into the chat check and see how you wonderful people are doing on this fine, fine morning. Again, let me reset the table with questions here. Here's a question I got. Uh, overall grade for the Eagles from the end of last season to right now, coordinators included, what grade would you give the Eagles on the offseason moves to this point? Draft a month away. Free agency still open. Names still available. Oh, geez. Hold on. How dare I? All over the place. Must be just too. There's just too much from the weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there is a report on the horizon. Um, I want to make sure I get this gentleman's name correct. Oh, yeah. Was, um, Jim Bowden uh, of MLB Network. Uh, sources tell Jim Bowden that Montgomery, uh, Jordan Montgomery, has long-term contract offers from two teams. He says that a, uh, a signing is probably going to happen this week. Although the identity of clubs, this is off MLB.com, although the identity of the clubs that made the offers to Jordan Montgomery and the number of teams currently bidding for Montgomery are unknown, Bowden writes the Yankees and the Red Sox, shocking, are still involved to some degree. He also mentions the Orioles and Diamondbacks as teams to watch. Um, come on. Yeah. So hopefully the Phillies are one of the mystery teams. The problem here, uh, the 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 concern, especially if you don't have Taiwan Walker, you're gonna need another pitcher. Uh Jordan Montgomery, I'd like to have in the rotation anyway, but uh, even over Taiwan Walker. Uh, but uh Jim Bowden reporting that he has uh two teams giving him, and here's the scary words, long term contract offers. Philly is in the market for a short-term deal. They were supposedly in on a short-term deal for Blake Snell. Blake Snell went to the San Francisco Giants, and now they're in on a short-term deal for Jordan Montgomery, supposedly, maybe, possibly, uh, but he has long-term offers at his disposal. If you've already got a World Series ring, uh, and who knows, he's still signed a long-term deal. I don't know if he's going to win it with the Orioles. I don't know if he's going to win it with the Diamondbacks, but if it's a long-term contract, then he's going to take that long-term contract over the short-term contract. Unless he just really loves Philadelphia. So let's let's hope. Let's hope that he really loves Philadelphia. Because I'd love to see him here. I'd love to see him here. All right. Let's get into the chat. Check and see how you wonderful people are doing on this fine, fine. Monday morning, opening week for your Philadelphia Phillies. Sean Gillespie, good morning. April, good morning. Twiz, what's popping? Asia. Robertson, Robertson, Robertson. Nice to see you. Everyone saying hi. Twiz, you ready for the opening? Oh, look at this. People are excited. Let's go, Fells. You're a Mets fan, right? What? Huh? Who's a Mets fan? Sean Kilrain. IBH, what's popping? Reddick. All right, I love it. It's Sean Kilrain. Reddick has to stay. Stats don't lie. Speaks for itself. You find no argument for me, friend. Find zero argument for me when it comes to Hassan Reddick. Uh, it was funny. I went to, what the hell was I? Oh, I was going back and looking at his uh, Wikipedia with the Cardinals. And when I went, I was like, oh, I forgot he was he, he was tied with the league, in, uh, tied for the league lead in forced fumbles in 2022. It's just one of those weird things that I don't really, I didn't really pay attention to. I was like, oh, yeah, look at that. I forgot about that. Uh, what did he end up with? Come on. Yeah, four straight double-digit sack seasons. Yeah, I'll keep that guy here. I'll keep that guy here. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to see the game log. Because I felt like it was a big... All right, that's the end of the season, start of the season. <laughs> All right, so he gets the cast off in uh, after week three. 
sack against the Commanders, two sacks against the Rams, two and a half sacks against the Jets in a loss, no sacks against Miami, weirdly enough, in a good defense game the team played then. Uh, sacks in three straight games, misses a, or skips a game, half sack, two sacks against the Cowboys in that loss against the Cowboys, and then he went one, two, three, four, five straight, six straight games, including the uh, playoffs, six straight games without a sack. Either way, I want that guy on my team. Four straight 11 sack seasons. Hells yeah, man. He'll be 30. He'll still be 29 if he's on the Eagles team and, and when they play in Brazil. Bottom line is he'll be 29 when the season really starts and then soon after 30. He's a September 22nd birthday. There you go. Uh, oh, Asia, you work at City Field, but he's no Mets fan. There you go. Or Asia. I said he. I don't know. Uh, the only Asia I know is a, is a lady. Um, and then there's the continent, obviously. Um, City Field. I haven't been to City Field yet. Twiz, okay. Oh, this chick is a Yankees fan. There we go, Asia. Thank you, Asia. Oh, yeah. Did you notice that, Sean Kilrain? Sirianni. Sirianni. Uh, yes, NFL coaches took their annual group photo at the league meetings in Orlando. Sirianni pulling a Belichick, a no-show. I saw I saw uh, Jeff McClain tweet that as well. I looked at the picture, and of course, you know, I, I think like many people, I just like looked for my head coach, right? And I was like, where's where's Sirianni? Where's where's uh, where's uh, where's uh, Nikki uh, Nikki C's? Where where where, where is he at? Wasn't there? There's a couple of missing coaches. I thought I counted them up. I didn't get the thirty-two. But then again, I did repeat kindergarten, so don't. Uh, Joe Whip, this is interesting. Okay, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -boop. just wondering. But has Fangio style defense ever won a Super Bowl? If not, why use it? Um. Fangio obviously lost with the 49ers. Didn't do anything with the Broncos. Nothing worth bragging about with, well, I mean, franchise record at sacks with the Dolphins, but nobody gives a damn about that. Um, I don't think so. Eagles went to the Super Bowl, obviously, with Gannon running his scheme. The reason uh, people use it, and maybe this is unfair, but this is how I think of it. Is the NFL an offensive league or a defensive league? Are sports in general offensive or defensive? Well, off offensive or defensive. They're offensive. So Fangio, Fangio's scheme is a, it, it really abuses the hell out of the old adage that Jim Johnson even used, which was bend but don't break. I like to say that Jim Johnson would definitely practice the bend, but don't break, but we might break you. That's the way I would describe Jim Johnson versus Vic Fangio. Jim Johnson would try to break you while trying not to break, while bending, going after the quarterback, being aggressive. I've told you guys many times, and when Hollis Thomas has been on the show with me, I referenced the first show that Hollis and I ever did together at – um Finnegan's Wake, man, rest in peace. And uh, he showed me, this is what Jim Johnson would do for a defense. He showed me a piece of paper, and it was just 11 arrows pointed at the quarterback. And I'm like, that's yeah, that's that seems like it would be. With Vic Fangio, Jonathan Gannon, that whole scheme, that's not what you're going to have. You might have three arrows, four arrows at the quarterback, five at most. So what it does is, basically, in a era of football in a game let's just call let's just stick the football here and just the, the game of football they're doing more and more things to help the offense and with that said they're just trying to limit big plays they are trying to give the offense and this might sound really crazy to people as many opportunities to make a mistake as humanly possible if you sit back and you allow those 10 15 play drives, then you might get that tipped pass. You might get that errant throw. You might get that bad decision. You might for force that fumble. You might win a one-on-one -on -one battle and get a big sack and something like that. It's not forcing mistakes. It's shell defense. It's quarters defense. It's um, not blitzing a whole lot. I mean, all that stuff. Uh, what it's trying to 
force or what's trying to take advantage of is the idea of you not making mistakes, but allowing the other team the opportunity to make that mistakes. Where this drives me the most crazy, just keeping in this division, let's say. Two years ago, the game that really drove me crazy, the Eagles are playing the Giants, and Daniel Jones is a guy you could, yeah, sure, he'll make mistakes, but you could also force him into making mistakes. He's not going to pick you apart. So why not dial up a blitz? Why not be a little aggressive? Why not force that fumble? Why not force him out of the pocket a little bit more? Why not try to make him make a mistake? Why not? Instead, you just give him all the time in the world to throw, and he'll dink and dunk you down the field. He won't take that huge throw down the field. He won't take that huge shot down the field. Those games against quarterbacks like that that you know, if you just rattle their cage a little bit, they're done for the rest of the game. And that's what drove me crazy about Gannon not going after him a lot. Obviously, Desai, obviously. Or Desai never got the opportunity with the, uh, the Daniel Jones. Um, but even with Fangio, that's, that type of thing just drives me bonkers. So the reason it's becoming more popular is because, well, look, I think it's a concession. All right, look. We know the league, all the rules are benefiting the offense. So if we just don't allow the big play and we can maybe have them make a mistake, maybe we jump a route, maybe we make a play, then we'll be better off. But if we allow quick drives, you know, seven, eight play drives where they're just down the field in no time with a big 50 yard gain somewhere, then, you know, if we just, if we just hold that off, then we'll be good to go. Uh, but it's a good question, Joe. Thank you. Twiz, as much as it's killing me, take care of Barkley. That's funny. We'll try. B. Costello, trade Bradbury, keep Reddick. Ah, uh, yeah. I it, please love the love for that to happen. Uh, we will Twiz uh, got a team around number twenty six. <laughs> Want to know uh, why? We uh, signed Will Grier to uh, a quarterback one-year deal, quarterback factory, because camp bodies, I don't know. I don't know. Watch. Watch. I don't know. I don't even want to go into the quarterback factory idea, but I understand. Um, Eagles offseason, uh, A- minus so far. Okay, Sean. A-. minus. Twiz not playing on that horrible field as much. He doesn't have to be oh, our workhorse. Should keep, uh, should help keeping him healthy with uh, Slay or um, Saquon. Yeah, Twiz gives the Eagles a B to this point. Twiz, how many quarterbacks do you need? You know what? Apparently, too much. Uh, basically, a coach to get Jalen up to speed with the playbook. Yeah, he can speak. He can speak Kellen Moore. Andrew Dirk, I'd give Howie Roseman a solid A minus. Need to see more defense. I agree. With coaching and free agents, Sean Kilrain gives him a B plus. Tough grade, Sean. I get it. Hey, look, if I'm giving him an A, a B plus is only one off. I you know from what I'm thinking. So yeah, we're we're close to the same page. Uh, Sean Gillespie can't believe they won that game. Sixers showing some spirit. Well, this is what happens. This is what happens when you get multiple contributors. But it's not just Tyrese Maxey having to score like thirty points, and other guys are contributing. Cam, like Tobias Harris and campaign were the difference. Like I'm used to seeing Kelly Oubre make some plays now. The reverse dunk he had against the Lakers. Lakers, yeah, it was that was Friday night. I think that was pretty sick. Uh, Tyrese Maxey putting up points we're used to, obviously. Tobias Harris, we are not. Campaign, we are not. Five threes for campaign? Hell yeah, brother. That's the difference. April, so close to opening day. Think Tank. Is that Russell Westbrook? Fly, Eagles, fly, baby. Daz, good morning. Sign Trevor Bauer. Daz, morning, bud. Why, Niners, why? What's going on? Good morning, Farzi and friends. Farzi and friends, close second. Finished close second to Farzi show. Uh, hope everyone has had a beautiful week, and thanks for starting the week off right with a ton of positivity. I am feeling pretty positive, baby. It's opening week. It's hard to be negative on our opening week. 
<laughs> Cy Young pitcher for league minimum. Yes, please. Uh, da, da, da. Yamamoto out there getting paid $400 million with an 8 ERA. That's funny, Daz. <laughs> Twist. Farzi and Bill's midday show? I don't know about that, bud. Uh, by the way, did you guys catch any of it? Me and Sills, Dan Silio on Friday. Dan Silio lit literally made me cry. Because when I'm on with Bill on Thursdays, he'll drop a big Bills on me, and I just think that's hilarious. And I didn't know if Dan Silio had seen it or not. I didn't know if Sills had seen it. And we're all friendly, and it's all cool stuff, but it's not like you know, you know stupid drama stuff. It's funny. So I'm on with Sills, and he drops uh, I know you were on with Big Bills, and I lost it. I Saturday Night Live blooper reel lost it. Uh, couldn't contain it. Had to go to the tissues. Uh, and if you guys know I'm a late night TV fan, Johnny Carson when something was just outright hilarious and they would lose it and they'd start crying because they were laughing so hard, he would bring out the tissues. And I went right to the tissues. I was literally crying. When Dan Cilio dropped the big bills on me, I, oh, dude, I was literally crying. Oh, you're going to get an apology from Shohei Otani today, Daz? And then they throw, they throw him a parade. That's funny. This Otani possible scandal will be definitely swept under the rug, says Sean. <laughs> well, my interpreter has my Mac card. That's funny. Nice twiz. They should have his translator there translating for him. Well, they will. It'll just be a different translator. The pick of Otani next to Butts was funny. Or Betts. Jeez. Not Butts. What's on my mind? Uh, the uh, pick of Otani next to Betts was funny. Might not want to put them near each other. Ah, that's great. Bet like an interpreter trademark. For Thank you very much, Sean. Appreciate it. I knew you'd like that one. All really depends on the draft, but I would say an A minus. <coughs> A minus for now. Twin solid B for the Eagles. <laughs> Why not as well? I'm good at saying in my lane, pom poms flying. Go far as he pom poms. That's funny. It doesn't matter what defense you run, defense will be mostly non existent with the rules. Anyway, KJ, that's kind of the point. It's kind of the point I'm making. They don't give a damn about defense anyway. So, as a defense, why should I care about us making any big plays when everything favors them anyway? Dunmore Vic never saw a Super Bowl. Oh, never won a Super Bowl. Okay, yeah. Yeah, never won a Super Bowl. <laughs> Swiss, I love the argument. Then Vic is due for a Super Bowl. Spags has won four Super Bowls. I'd rather win. I'd rather use that. I would, too. I would, too. Uh, begging for Fangio to be fired as soon as we let up a touchdown on the first drive. Yeah. We will be begging KJ. How about that Flyers win? Flyers lost. Um, Joshua Stewart, what's going on? Why don't the Eagles just extend Hassan Reddick on this his last year? Let him play out his contract. If he bail, if he balls out, uh, pay the big bag. Well, because Hassan wants a new deal. And if the Eagles give him a new deal, it's going to be a horse, you know what deal. It's going to be bull. It's going to be a backloaded deal that he'll never see the end of. So, yeah, that's why, unfortunately. Thanks, everybody, in the chat. Uh, appreciate you guys as per usual. Like I mentioned, Sixers are back on it tonight. 10 o'clock start time in Sacramento, where they finish up their road trip. Uh, they have an opportunity tonight uh, with the end of this road trip to go even. What was it, Phoenix? Yeah, Phoenix was the first game of the trip. Yeah, Phoenix, they lost to the uh, 
Lakers, Clippers, Sacramento. Hopefully they could beat Sacramento tonight, 10 o'clock again. Uh, they win that game. They go four for four, uh, they go two for two on the four game road trip, and then they come home to face the Clippers again Wednesday night, and then Friday they're in Cleveland, Sunday they're in Toronto. So a lot of road games here, a lot of road games. What a week we have here, ladies and gentlemen. What a week. Flyers, by the way, they did lose. It was four to one, I believe, was the final. Yeah, four to one. Then they got the Rangers tomorrow night. So uh, it's a tough. Game. Oh, the win over the Bruins though was good. We can talk about that. That's nice. Uh, win yet yeah, a loss yesterday against the Panthers. Not so great. So that's where we're at right now in life. But the Flyers are back at it tomorrow against the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. Seven o'clock puck drop. Uh, we got uh, Philly's opening day Thursday. We got NFL owners meetings going on right now. Look forward to maybe hearing from Jeffrey Lurie, hearing from Howie Roseman, hearing from Nick Sirianni. Uh, we'll see how all that goes. I'd love for Nick Sirianni, Nick Sirianni to get another opportunity here to explain what the hell he does in a nice way. Get asked that question. What is it you say you do here? So we'll see if we get that this week. Oh, the Wings. My beloved Philadelphia Wings have two games this week, one Thursday and one Saturday. So make sure you can make it on down to the Wells Fargo Center, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's the show. Uh, I'm going to be making an announcement um, about me later in the week. Some things are coming together. Uh, that would in, invo involve uh, more of me. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzetta. Hey, don't worry. In two hours, I'll be on with our friends at Birds 365, Jody Mack and Johnny Mack on the Jake and Media YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe to the Farzy Show. Make sure you hit subscribe on the Jake and Media Show as well, the Jake and Media channel as well, uh, and all that fun stuff. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzad. This is the Farzy Show presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Be back with you guys in two hours on Birds 365, and then again tomorrow morning, same time, same place. See you guys then.